Welcome to your educational screencast for Physics 12. Uh, this session is on electrostatics, an introduction to static charge. Uh, the session's broken into three main pieces. Uh, first, what is an electric charge? Two, how do objects develop an electric charge and is there a way to predict whether it will be positive or negative? And third, are, they, are there any illustrations of static electricity we could refer to in nature or in industry? So the first aspect today, uh, what is electric charge and how do objects develop that charge? Historically, scientists thought that all matter was made up of small particles called atoms, which were electrically neutral. Experiments in static electricity soon showed that atoms are made of two smaller constituent parts, some which were positive and others which were negative. We initially thought that these positive and negative particles were evenly distributed throughout the atom. But uh, particle physics experiments, in particular Rutherford's gold foil experiment shown here, um, uh, showed that atoms must in fact be mainly empty space. Just about all particles passed right through the atoms of gold, and only a few were deflected. That must have meant that the positive and very dense part of the atom was very, very small compared to the rest. So the model of the atom they refined to show that the negative particles in the atom must be distributed around the outside. Um, and those negative particles later uh, were classified or, or named electrons, as shown here. Um, and the overwhelming majority of the mass of the atom, over 99% of it, uh, was in a very, very dense and very, very small core they called the nucleus. Although this diagram is not to scale, uh, it does give you some sense of how small the nucleus must be compared to the rest of the size of the atom. The nucleus contained all of the positive charge of the atom, and further experiments in um, particle physics with magnets tried to explore if there was any smaller structure. Turns out there was. Uh, when they passed atoms between magnets, they found three particles were deflected. Uh, one, the electrons were deflected to the left, um, very tight, um, and there was a positive particle, opposite charge, deflected to the right. Um, they labeled those as the proton. An equally massive particle wasn't deflected at all, must be neutral, and they called that the neutron. The point of this is to show that the positive particles in atoms, the protons, are locked so deep in the atom, in the nucleus, they are really inaccessible in any direct physical way. Static electricity, therefore, must involve some interaction with the electrons only. So if we were to look at uh, a way of charging some objects, say the, the sweater, wool sweater I'm wearing here, um, each of the atoms uh, that make up the compounds in the wool sweater would be surrounded by electrons and crudely shown in this diagram here. And if I was trying to develop some static charge in an object, say a comb or a piece of vinyl, I'd bring it up to the wool sweater and I'd rub it back and forth against the wool sweater. So as that happens, the only particles that are likely to interact directly would be the electrons in the outside regions of the two materials. So if you rub them back and forth, then there's a chance electrons could be transferred from one to the other. In this case, the electrons are transferred from the wool onto the vinyl. Uh, now a little bit larger scale view of this to give us some better perspective. Um, although there would be millions or billions of electrons transferred, let's just crudely look in large collections of them. Vinyl is an insulator, so any electrons that get transferred onto it, those clumps of charge would stay in one location. Now remember, those negative charges came from the piece of wool. So wherever they left the piece of wool, that would leave the wool with a corresponding positive charge due to the absence of the electrons that it left. So the vinyl, which gained electrons or gained negative charges, would have a net negative charge and the wool would be left with a net positive charge. So if we arbitrarily assigned a value of 5 or negative 5 to the vinyl, we'd have to have a positive uh, charge of 5 for the wool. Uh, because altogether these things were electrically neutral to begin with before they were rubbed back and forth. So, in summary then, negative charges, the electrons, are in the outer regions of the atoms uh, and the molecules. Um, electrons can be moved from one object to another and they will be the only ones accessed in some direct physical way. 
Positive charges, the protons, are locked within the nucleus of the atoms and therefore cannot be physically moved to create a charge. So if an object gains electrons, it will have a net negative charge. And if an object loses electrons, it will have a net positive charge. So is there a way to determine what type of charge will develop on either object if they were to come in contact with each other? Experiments in the 1800s explored this and they established what's now called the triboelectric series. So if we take a look at the example we just went through, uh, if we look at the wool that was in my sweater and compared it to the vinyl that we rubbed it with, Wool is on the positive end of the series, which means it's going to tend to lose electrons. Remember, electrons are the only things that can be affected. Uh, you can't access the protons. They're locked deep inside the nucleus. Um, the vinyl down here on the negative side would have a tendency instead to gain electrons. So, if you lose electrons, you'll tend to have a positive charge overall. If you gain electrons, you'll tend to have a negative charge overall. And that explains the charges that were developed on the vinyl and the wool. But you don't have to consider items that are on opposite sides of neutral in this series. You can look at any two items uh, that you wish. So for example, let's take uh, your hands, uh, which are on the positive side, and compare those to if you rubbed your hands against some fur. Although fur is still on the positive side of the series, it is closer to neutral than your hands were. So it is going to relatively develop a negative charge. So you can compare any two items in the triboelectric series, just find their rank, and that will help you determine what charge they will develop. Now in our example, we were rubbing the vinyl against the wool, but there are actually two main ways that you can establish static charge. Um, in the list that you see here, the first six are all dealing with some sort of direct physical interaction. So going through them quickly, um, you can just have two objects in contact with some pressure between them and that can cause some electrons to transfer back and forth. Again, you would refer to the triboelectric series to determine which one would gain and which one would lose. Um, you can have two materials in contact, uh, like in the video shown here, two pieces of tape, and you can pull these two objects apart. And as you pull them apart, one object will tend to take electrons off of the other, leaving one of them positively charged, the other one negatively charged. Here you can see that the two pieces of tape are attracted to each other as opposite attract. Uh, frictional charging is the next example, and that's what we did with the wool and the vinyl. Um, clash charging, uh, two objects colliding with some velocity at impact, electrons could transfer from one to the other. Uh, vapor charging, um, most commonly seen with say spray paint or spraying perfume. As the particles go through the very narrow nozzle, again it's like friction, uh, some electrons would likely be transferred off of the nozzle onto the vapor or vice versa depending upon what was used. Uh, and finally, you can roll one object over top of another. Again, there's some physical pressure there which would cause some transfer of electrons from one particle, one object, excuse me, to the other. Um, the other three is an upcoming topic. It'll be in our next video series in the, uh, in the screencasts. And that is uh, involving induction where it does not require direct physical contact. So we'll leave those for the moment. What are some of the issues that come up in industry? Most of them have to do with mechanical systems where you're moving something in an assembly line format. So for example, if uh, you're moving multiple sheets of plywood or paper, if any static charge develops, you're not going to pull one sheet at a time, you'll pull several. Or if you have part feeders that are adding small parts into an assembly line, again, any static charge would have those parts clumped together. Uh, even personal safety, if static electricity builds up on uh, some objects in the assembly line and people are involved in, in moving the product, uh, then they could experience uncomfortable or even dangerous electric shocks. Um, electronic components, of course, anything to do with computer-related technology would be very sensitive to electric discharges from static electricity, um, or even uh, unloaders that are moving parts on and off. Painting you may not have thought of before, but uh, spray painting, as shown in the previous clip, um, can develop static charges on them, and that means as the paint moves towards, say, the door of a car shown here, the distribution of the paint would be uneven. So this is a real challenge for industry, how they're able to manage static charge that gets built up as uh, objects interact during some sort of assembly line. 
So, in summary, electric charges can be developed in two ways, through physical contact or through a process called induction. And again, that's the next one in the uh, screencast series. The polarity of the charge created in each object can be determined with the triboelectric series. So you just have to look at the two substances involved, whether it's physical contact or induction, but you'll be able to determine which one has a positive and which one has a negative charge. And finally, charged objects will exert an attractive force on other materials. Uh, it can cause problems in manufacturing, have safety concerns, etc. Uh, and so the video with the two pieces of tape that you saw would be a good illustration of that. Perhaps one of the most dramatic examples of static charges attracting each other uh, would be in the example of lightning. Um, with the help of some high-speed video, we'll try to illustrate how lightning happens. Lightning normally takes a fraction of a second, but with high-speed video, these ones are shot at seven to 10,000 frames a second. It slows down the interaction so we can see the negative charges creating a leader heading down from the negatively charged cloud that repels electrons from any tall structure, leaving it relatively positive, creating a positive leader coming up. Where those two paths connect, that's where the lightning takes place. And there will be a transfer of charge up and down repeatedly between the ground and the cloud, trying to neutralize the charge that is formed in the cloud. The simulation might help illustrate the idea more clearly. As the negatively charged cloud pushes down through a conducting path, that pushes electrons away from the tree, creating a relatively positive connection point. And there's many flashes that can happen back and forth for lightning. This even happens when you rub your feet on the carpet and develop a negative charge in your body. The electrons will repel off your fingers through the air to any path connected to the ground. So to explain this perhaps a little bit more clearly, the static charge that forms in the clouds is created by friction between particles of dust and ice. So for example, if this region of the cloud became a positively charged region because it lost electrons, and this region of the cloud over here became negatively charged because it lost the electrons, when those two regions get close enough to each other, a conducting path will form and electricity will flow from, in this case, from the left towards the right and we call that sheet lightning. Over here on the left hand side we could have another situation where the clouds are also positively charged in this region here. And because they're positively charged, if that gets close enough to the ground, that will create a negative charge on the ground attracting electrons in that region. If the cloud is close enough to the ground, those electrons would follow a path up through here from the ground up to the cloud to neutralize the charge in the cloud. But that's not the only possibility. We could have the reverse take place where the cloud becomes negatively charged. And what that would do is repel the electrons. So the electrons that used to be in the ground near the surface have now been repelled farther away. This leaves the ground comparatively positively charged. And if there's all, ever a taller structure here, that taller structure would have its electrons repelled by the cloud and move down into the ground. You can see an example over here on the right hand side. But back to the left, this would create a relatively positive channel for the electrons to work their way down. So the electrons would follow this path through to the ground and they would move, in this case, now downwards following that conducting path. So lightning can occur as sheet lightning between clouds or between regions of a cloud. It can be from the cloud down to the ground or from the ground up to the cloud. The next video sequence that you'll see, uh, again of high speed footage, um, illustrates these different types of lightning. If you know what to look for, you'll be able to tell whether the lightning is heading from the cloud to the ground, or from the ground up, or could even be sheet lightning. Hard to see, but there's a cell tower there. A little more visible here, so the electricity is flowing from the ground, negatively charged ground, up to a positively charged cloud. And notice it takes many paths and those currents flow several times. There's the electron flow heading up into the cloud. S 
superheating the air, producing a lot of visible light, that flash we see as lightning. The sound, of course, is thunder, which travels much slower. Two radio towers in this case, the unlucky one is on the left. In this sequence here, you've got sheet lightning on the right-hand side that just happened, followed by fork lightning from the ground up on the left-hand side. So, golfing in a thunderstorm, bad idea. Especially if the clouds above you are positively charged, you will be the source of electricity coming from the top of your golf club up to the clouds. So, in summary, a buildup of charges in clouds are caused by friction between dust, ice, and vapor. And because the clouds have charge, that excess charge in the clouds can be large enough that it can force electrons to follow conducting channels through the air. The air heats up and glows. Um, that's what we call lightning. Negatively charged clouds can repel electrons in the ground, leaving taller objects with a net positive charge. This sets up the conducting path between the clouds and the ground. Although there are more than three types of lightning, I've crudely described three here, it can pass between clouds, called sheet lightning, from the clouds to the ground, or from the ground to the clouds. Those last two would be fork lightning. So, during a thunderstorm, stay inside.